Read by Charles Bowden from the book Some of the Dead Are Still Breathing, Living in the Future. I see red. The color flashes across the gray light as the black coffee wafts across my face. The dark comforts me, and so I rise before first light. The moonless nights are best because in the blackness, even the trees lack form. Shapes slowly enter the yard. The stone body of St. Francis, big clump of vine stroking the mesquite. Everything gray at first, the first licks of color, a tint of green, a blush of rose, come and go. I have read for years about photons of light and the structure of our eyes and how our eyes and structure in the eyes form colors. Other species see a different world. I understand none of this. Since I waddled in diapers, I have marveled at color creeping into the land at gray light, and then slowly drenching everything in my gaze. At gray light, I always believe, but I cannot clearly tell myself what this belief is. But with that first cup of coffee, I am always a yes man, and this feeling can continue past the midnight hour. Names don't help me much anymore. They belong to that time when everything was kept in its place, before the winds came up and the winter came up and licked the land away. This land is your land. This land is my land. This land is gone. For more than 50 years I have come to this place, a city older than our flag, and now it is dead. Nine months ago, I was in the dead city after the wind rose. The levees breached and water came in. Two months ago, I was again in the dead city. Soon, I know I must return to the dead city. I sat in the Napoleon House, a bar in the quarter where Sherwood Anderson and William Faulkner hashed out the future of American literature in the 1920s. Two blocks away, Tennessee Williams wrote the play. I ate red beans and rice, had a glass of wine. I walked through the open door of a house, studied the splotches of mold on the wall, and felt the sadness on the abandoned pool table, covered with the grey powder left by the waters. An overhanging stained glass lamp stared at the felt with a dead eye. A few days ago, I was out in the desert, with the dead trees and empty skies. I stood by an ironwood, a species good for seven or eight hundred years. The small tree seemed more dead than alive, a mound of spent limbs with a few struggling leaves here and there. I stooped and examined a cascade of earlier struggles, ledges in the stump where the plant had all but died then rallied when caressed by a breath of rain and shot up a new stem which thickened and in, say, two hundred years' time, also faced that killing drought, died back, and then this plateau of doom lifted and yet another new stem raced to drink the sun and believe once again in immortality. Before that, I was in a city of the south, past the snake of dirt linking two continents, in that south of the Americas, the place celebrating another pain, climbing hillsides where residents clamber up slopes equal to a 25-story building to reach their homes. I got out of a car with a local, and he told me to take off my jacket, a beat-up blue windbreaker with 20 years of abuse. He said it was too bright. In the clinic, up on the hillside, the two women helping with the various local ailments offered that drug use and pregnant 12-year-olds were high on the list of local medical problems. How tough is it here? I asked. One woman looked at my old tennis shoes and explained that I could be killed for such footgear. She was 47 years old and had lived here all of her life. What do you do about the gangs? I asked. I avoid their eyes she said as her eyes met mine. As the street markets in the city center, bras and panties, all the stalls illegal, everyone looks and no one seems to buy. At night, the streets go cold. Everything shuts down. 
and men sprawl on the sidewalks with foil pipes, smoking basuko, the potion rendered from cocaine paste, and young men stare with hungry eyes, and women in short skirts with breasts spilling out look with greedy eyes, and night comes down like the lid on a garbage can. And I have no answer, and would believe no answer given me, and I think of the dead city back home, where the hurricane came, and then the big water and the abandoned houses with one word spray-painted on some lonely and ruined homes, Baghdad. One day when gray clouds rolled in, I sat in the low light and wanted the words and metaphors to be over. Maybe someone can write a scene like this. We are all on a train and it is racing toward a bridge that is out, but no one on the train cares because they are busy arguing about train security measures or who gets to sit in which car or whether the train is only for people or whether the train is only for one sex or the other or maybe the train should be divided up according to race or language or religion and still the train races toward the bridge that is gone, races toward some chasm that will shatter it and so the people argue and do not care that their behavior means they can never reach the future. But words are all I have. My skills are limited and the words at best are a veil, maybe even a shroud between us and this world we touch but cannot embrace, a bowl of dirt we stand on but never can really know. We want a clean thing. We want Ten Commandments, a list of solid answers, a form we fill out and then we're done with the mysteries, perhaps a chant we can murmur in the dark hours. But the real writing is not on any page. It is everywhere. Cities have morphed into giant splatters of flesh and materials, and we call them mega this and that. But our words cannot capture the reality that slaps our faces. We can't wrap our minds around the vast dying now taking place, the exit of plants and animals without even a goodbye note as they leave us behind. And it is not like the near beer version peddled by the good book merchants of gloom, no. It is the silence of life, fleeing this place of life, the silent caravan of beasts and fish in the sea and whales leaving our world and going over Jordan. But this time, the land is not promised, but forsaken. People, we can't talk about people. People everywhere, crowding the beaches, jamming their lives into the canyons, smearing the plains with their houses and ribbons and bows, terracing hillsides with shacks that barely get them through the lonely nights. We cannot say this thing about people, that there are too many of us and not enough of everything else. And so we turn away and dream of the warm, soft times when lullabies caressed our faces and we bathe in the twinkle of stars on those first summer nights. We have ceased to say things. Soon, as more cities go dead, we will struggle to remember their names, just as the vanishing beasts are nowhere on our tongues. I am driving down a back road and find a tortoise sitting on the asphalt. I stop and move it to the ditch and it clambers off into the tall grass, living in the future, both of us. They are a family of three. The male, a brilliant red, the female drab gray with rivulets of scarlet and fledging blotches of red and gray and the dark beak of an immature. They always come early to the feeders to avoid the din of the hundreds of birds that will soon descend. The old metal chair creaks as I lean forward to watch them. The pair nested this spring in the oleanders on the east side of the house, a fact I knew as a kind of rumor. Cardinals are easy to spot and yet furtive by nature and tend to live in a band of life that runs three to eight feet off the ground. The ground here whispers life. My best friend's ashes nourish a cactus three feet from my coffee cup. Those last few months when he was drowning in a cocktail of suicide, drink, electroshock, 
cocaine, detox, and games of chance. He'd sit on the patio with glazed eyes, and birds would sing in the yard and bounce from limb to limb. I was never sure he noticed. On the hillsides outside of my town, Palo Verde stand dead with their scant leaves and green skin, their skeletal limbs scratching the dry blue sky. The rains have failed for more than a decade, and now trees native to this ground begin to die. The cardinals flash past my eyes, and the female disappears into a grove of pacopodium palms, a succulent from Africa. When we planted them, a friend steeped in horticulture told us they would at best last three to five years, and then would come a killing frost. For some seasons, we covered them with blankets in the winter. By the time they grew too tall for such efforts, the earth had begun to warm, and the freezes had stopped, and they flourish. The male cardinal is up in the mesquite over the palms, the fledgling off to one side with a look almost of abandonment. Cardinals raise two to four broods a season, and the fledgling is about to get the boot. Cardinalis cardinalis is territorial, like a lot of bird species. Male robins will attack a stuffed robin if the chest booms a decent red, but ignore a stuffed immature robin with its dull feathers. You can see a war out there, or you can see a friendly place, or you can simply see and skip the words. Our feeders swallow 150 pounds of seed a month. Birds have thronged here during all my good times and bad times. They know my face and fall from the sky when they see me put out food in the first light of day. When storms whip through the desert, strange species descend, refugees from the winds. Sometimes pelicans from the distant Gulf of California arrive with shell-shocked eyes and must be trucked back to a realm of water and fish. The female cardinal alights on the top of a trellis with the dry spine of a palo verde stem in her mouth. She swoops and again disappears into the palms. She's building a nest. In the nation of cardinals, the females are the builders. The cardinals now number a hundred million a century ago, they were a southern songbird. Now they are in Canada. They have caught a favoring wind. Not so long ago, borders were lines on a map, hardly noticed on the actual ground. Years ago, I sat on a sand dune while a family from Oaxaca, a man, the wife in her long Indian skirt, and two toddlers huddled under a creosote bush 15 feet away, alert. We were all maybe 20 feet south of the line. Two border patrol trucks staring at us. The Oaxacans were waiting for the trucks to move on so that they could dart into the nation to the north. The day was hot, the air dry. The fence was a sketch of wiring running feeble under the huge blue sky. Other Mexicans lived all over the dunes in huts made of loading dock pallets and cardboard. I thought if the poor were streaming up in family-sized chunks from the distant south, then the earth itself was failing. I could not find the name for this new condition. Now everywhere is a line, and crossing these lines grows harder, and the lines themselves leap magically upward, and become walls and razor wire and bullets and cells, absolute. The cardinals come and go all day, the red slicing my eye, the heat is rising on my ground, the rain's vanishing, and still they build that nest as I sit with coffee by the ashes of a defeated friend. In 1886, cardinals were rarely sighted north of the Ohio River. By 1895, they were living around the Great Lakes. They moved into Iowa, then to Dakotas, following the Missouri River and its tributaries. They colonized southern Canada. The move north seemed to follow people, their yards and their feeders, and all this began to happen before temperatures seemed to rise and rise. In the city of the south, revolution is in the mouth of the government, but is not the sound of the streets. 
The market is car horns, constant car horns, car alarms rapping in the background, voices shouting and laughing, the roar of cycles, buses grinding through the gears, the rings and chirps of cell phones, the swish of awesomely tight jeans, music blaring from boom boxes, always hip hop and always with a drum machine, a walloping sound that never ends in shrieks and squeals and roars and thumps and slides and crashes, a pounding on the skull that functions like smog in the great cities of the earth, so omnipresent it is all but undetectable. The standard uniform is tight breeches and halter tops and generous breasts, shored up by ferocious brassiers. The nation is the vanity center of the Western Hemisphere, famed for its beauty queens, a champ in per capita expenditure on cosmetics. The going rate for a new chest is about $22 a month. The women here walk with a slight sway to their hips, and they carry their breasts before them like sliced melons on a tray. It is the only nation I have visited where I've been fortunate enough to observe them stashing cell phones in their cleavage. The mannequins in the market all face ass outward, the buttocks like kettle drums. The traffic crawls. One day, I timed the progress of a car length at 90 seconds, another day three feet in one minute. The drivers are creative, storming down one-way streets against traffic, changing lanes with a faith in God that far exceeds my own. It hardly matters where this place is because it is so many places now. The spices vary, the weather also, but it is a city and it keeps growing and there is no work and no one really believes there will be work. They just live here after a fashion. There are programs. Policies, plans, meetings, slogans, marches, and lots of things to drink out of bottles. The revolution has arrived here, and its color is red. I get out of my chair, walk to the palms. In the fork of the tree where small arms reach out to support four crowns of leaves, I can see the nest. I drink their belief like a drug. A guy I know told me history's been carjacked. He said his friends thought he was bipolar. My beliefs are dull and dismissed out of hand. I believe that resources are limited and that no existing or imagined energy system can sidestep this fact. I believe that the increase in human numbers inhales ever more resources. I believe no energy system will deliver the punch of our declining fossil fuels at the same price. I believe no energy system will solve our problems since the problems come from within us and not from our turbines. I believe in red wine and the scent of women and the nuzzle of all dogs of all ages. I believe political systems create no resources but devour them at varying rates. I believe the politics of the right and left matter not at all to the bird on the wing or the trees dying on the hillsides. I believe in the future because the future is here and I am in it. I believe, not wonder, not doubt, not know. I believe. I believe in the dead city. I believe in the nest. I also believe in the late quartets of Beethoven and Gershwin's summertime. Oh my God, do I believe. <laughs>